my name is Ethan Zuckerman. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, in terms of the visual descriptions of these things, I'm a beefy white dude with a long beard. I managed to be bald and long haired at the same time. And I am in my uh, bright yellow office uh, on the third floor of my house in Western Massachusetts. And this is where I've been the last three days listening to uh, the wonderful conversations we've been having during this event. And I have to say, I've, I've heard this sense of people expressing the idea that we're somehow in uncharted territory. We are facing these new technologies that are capable of uh, incredible power. They, they're able to spread propaganda and disinformation. They can move people towards violence. We're not sure how to harness their potentials for good rather than just fall victim to the evils of it. And so I wanted to take us back a little bit in history and, and the folks organizing this may pull up some of the images that I sent them. Um, I wanna point out that despite the fact that it was 30 years between when we started learning how to route packets on the internet and the big commercial internet, we tend to think of that as light speed. Uh, but I gotta tell you, if we go back a century, there's a revolution that happened a lot faster and it was radio. Um, radio, as we know it, wasn't possible until 1912. Before 1912, radio was dots and dashes of static. It was the telegraph, right? The wireless telegraph. And in 1912, you have the invention of the triode amplifier. That's that pretty vacuum tube that was just being shown a moment ago. Once you have the triode amplifier, you have the ability to communicate speech and music over the airwaves for the first time ever. And within 10 years of that moment in 1912, not only do we see radio become this huge cultural force, but there's at least three different models of radio. In the Soviet Union, which is brand new, it's just come out of the Russian Revolution, radio gets used for propaganda. Everyone hears the radio, though no one owns one. It's broadcast through loudspeakers in town squares. It's broadcast in factories. And it's telling illiterate peasants how lucky they are to be part of the Soviet Union. And that's what radio was. That's what it was for. It was about indoctrinating a large set of people. In the US, we had a totally different model. Within a couple of years of 1912, you have stations like WOR, still exists in, in the photo that we have in the background there, who figured out this model. Advertisers would pay major money to reach people in their houses, people who weren't reading newspapers, kids, uh, women who were at home working on the housework, who they could reach. And that advertising provided a subsidy for news, but also for entertainment. Capitalism moved into radio full speed. And something that started in part as a nonprofit or academic phenomenon was almost purely a capitalistic space by the middle of the 1920s. And then there's Britain, which did it entirely differently from everybody else. In the UK, radio built something truly novel, public interest media. It was significantly independent, both of the government that was in power and of the commercial sphere. And it had this goal of making media that was good for us as members of society. So the reason I'm telling you this history from 100 years ago is that when a new technology comes to town, we have choices about how to use it. It doesn't necessarily need to broadcast propaganda. It doesn't have to become a commercial free-for-all. Instead, we can look at a new technology and invent something new. We can create digital public spaces that are actually designed to make us better neighbors and better and stronger citizens. And what's better than that is we can even change path midstream. So in the 1960s, a guy named Newt Minow becomes the head of the Federal Communications Corporation under President Kennedy. And he makes people really nervous. He's a left-wing radical. The broadcast industry is really freaked out about him. And in fact, his first speech in 1961 to the nation's television broadcasters, he says, look, when you run a television station, I want you to try a challenge. Watch your own programming for a day. I promise you that what you will see is a vast wasteland. 
Now we're at a vast wasteland moment with social media. When we see people organizing on Facebook, on Twitter, on Parler, on Gab, to go storm our nation's capital, to wave uh, segregationist, uh, seditious flags in the heart of our democracy, this is a vast wasteland that we're looking at. But everyone predicted that Newt <coughs> Mitchell would respond to television by <coughs> regulating the holy hell out of it and basically taking off the air the sort of light entertainment programming and turning it purely into something serious. For those of you who remember Gilligan's Island, if you remember the boat that capsizes, it's called the SS Minnow. That was a joke. That was a direct poke at the FCC chairman from people essentially saying, oh my God, are you going to put us out of business? But Minnow didn't do that. Actually, what he did instead is he built the architecture in place for the US to have its own kind of public media, pretty different from what happens in the UK, but pretty amazing. NPR, PBS, our whole public broadcast system. Now look, it's eight years between Minnow's vast wasteland speech and the launch of Sesame Street, a program that shows what television could look like if it's built in the public interest. It shows what could happen if we thought about television as a way to educate kids who aren't yet in school and not just educate them on numbers and ABCs, but on diversity and inclusion and a vision for a more just society. Sesame Street shows us that we don't always have to wait for the market. We can decide to build things that are good for society, even if they're not profitable. So throughout the last three days, we've been hearing from people who are seeing the limits of the systems that we've built, the way that they fall short, often for people of color, for women, for marginalized people, for peoples whose ideas are on the margins. But we have this tendency to over-focus on the systems that we already have. We're also hearing from people who have aspirations to build truly new and different digital public spaces. And I'm one of those folks too, and I'm not gonna go too far into the details, but if you wanna hear about how I wanna build this stuff, you can look up the phrase digital public infrastructure and read to your heart's content. But I wanna suggest that not only do we wanna find ways to build social media that's smaller, that's more distributed, that's moderated and governed by the people it serves. I want to suggest some of the big lessons that we might take from radio in the 1920s and public television in the 1970s. So here are those thoughts. The ways a particular medium works are never inevitable. It wasn't inevitable that social media would be free, but only free as in beer and supported by surveillance capitalism. It's never too late to change. And it's not always necessary to destroy everything that's come before. It's possible to build something new that complements whatever we have and starts to steer it in really meaningful new directions. Finally, the main barriers to changing the worlds of media are not technical or financial. They're actually the barriers of our own imagination. The biggest challenge is to get ourselves out of the trap that we have to fix the broken systems before we build new ones. This is one that I've been arguing with Talia and Eli about, even while I'm a huge, huge supporter of their works. I think it's really important that we wrestle with what's wrong with the existing networks. But I think we have to get rid of the notion that social media must work the way that Facebook or Twitter does today. So here's my invitation to you. Go beyond fixing what's broken. Imagine building spaces that aren't just less bad for us, but actively work to make us better neighbors, more effective citizens, and better connected to the world. You don't have to stop you don't have to make Gilligan's Island less bad. You need to start building Sesame Street as well. Thanks so much. It's great to be with you. All right. Woo, you can uh, shake your hands or you can unmute yourself. Woo. Thank you, Ethan. Don't be shy.